Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming to this Indigenous Anthropology Emergent Praxis Against Anthropological Deliriums Roundtable. We want to invite you all to come up front. This room is a tad bit larger than what we had expected. Um, so please do join us up in the front because we, um, after having our panelists respond, want to invite everyone to be a part of the dialogue. And um, at that point, when we do open up that uh, discussion time, uh, we ask also that you go to the microphone. Um, this session is being videotaped, um, just for your uh, awareness. So if you don't want to be videotaped, then you might not want to go up to that microphone. Um, but in any case, uh, thank you all for coming. Um, first off, uh, um, my name is Tai Kavikatanga, and I'm an associate professor in anthropology and ethnic studies at the University of Hawaii and co-organizer with uh, Bernard or Bernie Purley from the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. Um, first, we want to acknowledge the Cheyenne, Arapaho, Kiowa, and Ute peoples and territories of Colorado, um, and also uh, acknowledge the welcome that we received by John Imula Jr., a Kiowa and Arapaho elder and leader who honored us with a song in prayer in Kiowa um, at the opening of this conference. I mean, in a very moving way, saying how doing so in that language was one that showed his ability to survive the experience of boarding school and to be able to share the spirit um, in language that persisted despite the efforts of erasing his identity and culture, which are essential themes for what we're dealing with when we're thinking about an indigenous anthropology um, emergent against the colonial deliriums that have created notions of disappearing natives or the assumption that the erasure of political sovereignty was something that could be accomplished. Um, these and other stories and relationships are ones that we hope will only grow as the AAA begins to develop new protocols and procedures for honoring indigenous peoples and territories in all their future meetings. With regards to this session, um, just taking some of the points from our abstract, there's something strangely familiar in the current tension between indigenous praxis and its critics. In the second decade of the 21st century, indigeneity is simultaneously celebrated as, quote, engaged practices of self-determination against daily traumas of colonial domination, end quote, and also denigrated as relying on, quote, an obsolete anthropological notion and on a romantic and false ethnographic vision, end quote. We see in these latter comments the lasting effect of colonial deliriums as Western domination and dispossession of indigenous peoples. Participants in this roundtable engage the implications of colonial deliriums in anthropology and the emergence of indigenous anthropology. Our roundtable follows up on a great dialogue initiated yesterday by graduate students in the strange affinities of anthropology, alternatives, and ethnographic refusal session. In it, Claudia Serrato spoke of unlearning, relearning, and shape-shifting. Indeed, shape-shifting is the reality we live, at once shifting our own shapes in response to the various contexts we engage, but also shifting the shape of the discipline at the same time. For our panelists today, we sent the following questions to ponder. One, what does the practice of indigeneity in the field of anthropology look like based on your experiences? Two, what frames and language do or should we use to articulate understandings of indigenous worlds in the context of healing colonial deliriums? And three, how do we stage alternative conversations that lead to a decolonial indigenous anthropology? Each participant will offer a brief provocation in response to these questions, followed by responses and crosstalk between each of them and ending with an open dialogue with all of you. So first, I'd like to invite up my co-organizer and the first presenter on this panel, Bernie Purley, Associate Professor of Anthropology at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. Willis Paswell, Sidewen, Dangak. Okay, now this is where you say Medjida Besquin. <laughs> okay, and then you say Dungak Nagil, and I'll say Nil Namedj. Okay, so what I did was just uh, ask you, uh, good morning, uh, how are you? And that's in Maliseet. And you said, uh, 
well, you, you said you're doing fine, and then you asked me how I'm doing, and I said I am also doing fine. Well, when, one of the things that, uh, in this particular greeting, if you translate it literally into English, uh, it's, you know, it is, you know, how are you? Uh, but the response is more uh, still the one, or just the same. And so this is where, you know, the kind of translation from uh, an indigenous language into English becomes problematic and something is always lost in translation. And so one of the things we have to do is when we're engaging in these kinds of conversations is to recognize that there's always going to be some kind of slippage. And so for me, the other reason why I introduced with, you know, using uh, Maliseet uh, is to in give you the, uh, I don't want to give you the false impression that I am a fluent speaker of Maliseet. I am a learner of Maliseet. And one of the things that uh, I wanted to uh, point out is when we're dealing with you know, colonial deliriums, especially in anthropology, we have to be able to recognize that there is a lot more going on underneath than is you know, on the surface. Okay, so the fact that I use Maliseet at the beginning uh, does not suggest that I am a fluent speaker. I am relearning the language. That's one of the critical conditions of indigeneity that we all have to deal with. The second aspect is, well, my very first language when I was born was Maliseet. And uh, when I went to school, uh, the decision was made that I had to learn English at the expense of Maliseet. So now that I'm adult, an adult, I have to relearn the language. And again, that is one of the conditions of uh, indigeneity. Now, uh, the reason why I point this out is also to indicate for this particular panel and the kind of ideas I were dealing with, is to also suggest that the kind of, let's say, reclamation or repatriation of our indigenous cultures, our languages, our modes of being, is something that we're all exercising in our very different and diverse ways. And I'm really excited about the kinds of conversations that we're going to hear uh, in the next uh, hour. <coughs> now, getting back to anthropology, what does indigenous anthropology look like? Well, let me start with a story. Imagine sometime in the mid-19th century, you got these two anthropologists, colonial anthropologists, trudging through woods or forests or uh, rainforests or any other kinds of hostile environment, and they come into a clearing and they come across an indigenous village. Okay, so the first anthropologist smiles and looks at the other and says, look, we've discovered noble. The other one frowns and shakes his head. No, we've discovered savage. And in the meantime, the Indians are there. And the chief tells his uh, uh, community, uh-oh, it looks like we discovered anthropology. <laughs> now, the reason why I bring this up is to also indicate that when we think about anthropology and our discipline, uh, we're starting to recognize, and uh, as Ty was suggesting and quoting uh, Adam Cooper, uh, our indigenous, let's say, uh, self-determination from his perspective is somehow flawed, that somehow uh, the way we conceive of ourselves as uh, indigenous peoples is really based on uh, outmoded uh, anthropological concepts and some kind of romantic vision of a, uh, a, a savage or noble savage past. And one of the questions that I wanted to raise in the provocation is, well, how do we begin to untangle that kind of irony? So when Ty and I were talking about this, you know, one of the things that we wanted to highlight was the idea of emergent praxis. Okay, I deliberately did not use the word practice uh, and because that has its own kind of cultural baggage in anthropology, well, praxis has its own baggage as well. And a lot of people are going to kind of point to the kind of a Marxist uh, analysis. And so they say, well, okay, there's a way we can begin to understand that praxis and practice are two different things. Um, and that praxis somehow alerts us to a broader sort of phenomenon that's inherent in a particular, uh, let's say, uh, um, <clears throat> anticipatory, and uh, uh, um, articulation of uh, 
uh, space and being in a particular uh, imaginary. Now, one of the things I want to highlight is while praxis for me uh, is also a failed attempt, and so we have to use these words in order to be able to begin to uh, question them. So for me, it's everyday resistance against these kind of colonial dominations and the kind of traumas that uh, really alert us to the kind of uh, practice or praxis that we're engaging. And so my question then is, is praxis an idiom that can be translatable that colonial uh, modes of understanding can begin to engage? Can we contaminate colonial categories? Uh, the second part of this is a colonial deliriums. Uh, so Cooper makes the argument that we, as indigenous peoples, we're doomed to be ventriloquists uh, for colonial ideologies. And so going along with that, then indigenous uh, <coughs> Uh, articulations are merely the reinvention of the primitive. And so again, Cooper is not stepping back to understand you know, what his particular position is. That's another form of colonial domination, a kind of devoicing of indigenous experience. And so what I'd like to do in this particular panel is call on uh, the uh, panelists to really interrogate these issues. And so is this attempt uh, in tr articulating an emergent praxis, uh, an inversion uh, process. And I, I would say that yes, it is a inverting the categories, but more importantly, it's also a conversion process. And so what it does is it allows both indigenous and non-indigenous peoples to be able to begin to entertain the possibility of epistemic slippage. And through epistemic slippage, what we're doing is we're shifting our uh, boundaries of our knowledge and experience in order to be able to better understand the other. Unfortunately, Adam Cooper and like-minded anthropologists refused that epistemic slippage. And I am delighted that I have these colleagues that are going to really push that agenda so that we can all begin to understand one another. Thank you. Thanks, Bernie. Next up, we have Marama Murulanning, Research Fellow at the James Hanade Research Center at the University of Auckland. Uh, tuatahi kamihiki tō tātou kaihanga mō ngā mana ki tanga ki runga i tō tātou hui i tēnei rā. E mihi ana ki o koutou ngā mana, ngā reo, ngā pūkenga me ngā kārangaranga maha nō no reira tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā rā tātou katoa. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the Paiute, the Arapaho, the Cheyenne, and the Kaiowa people who uh, are the home people of this territory. So I'd just like to acknowledge that I'm here as a guest and I will be going home after the conference. Um, last night at our conference group dinner, uh, Bernie and Tai asked us to think about the concept shapeshifter and to translate it into our own language. And the word for shapeshifter where I'm from in the Waikato in New Zealand, and the Waikato is also a tribe or an iwi, we use the, ter the term tanifa. So a tanifa is the type of shapeshifter that is prominent in where I'm from. And tanifa are creatures that live in rivers and water bodies, and they can transform and turn into logs. They can tell you when danger is coming. They can be omens of, uh, they, can, they can tell you about good things about to happen. So. For where I'm from in the Waikato, Bernie and Tai, the word is tanifa. Um, the other thing I need to acknowledge is my colleague Merita, who's the fifth speaker on the panel here. So we're both from the James Henare Māori Research Centre at the University of Auckland. So I think I've thanked everybody now, the birds, the bees, the flowers, the trees, oh, and Tai and Bernie, thank you for inviting me. So now I'm going to read this very brief paper about the trajectory of Indigenous anthropology. To discuss the trajectory of an indigenous anthropology, it is vital to recognize that all indigenous knowledge is embedded in groups of people who inhabit specific places and that the significance of indigenous knowledge, or mātauranga, as Māori refer to it, is the relationships that local knowledge negotiate between people. Now it's impossible for me to talk about the realization of an indigenous anthropology without reflecting on our discipline's imperialist history and its current challenges. 
Because anthropology is understood and practiced differently around the globe, I will confine my discussion to New Zealand. The origins of anthropology in New Zealand go back to when Māori and Europeans first began asking questions of each other over 200 years ago. The dialogue between Māori and British intellectuals continued through the 19th and 20th centuries. This homegrown anthropology was influenced by the emerging British model of social anthropology, and it was to Britain that aspiring New Zealand anthropologists of Māori and non-Māori descent, of which Merita's father was one of them, went to professionalise themselves. It was not until the mid-20th century that anthropology became established in New Zealand's university system, mostly in departments combined with Māori studies in various combinations of the British social, or the Malinoskian, and the American four-field approach, or the Bo Bo Boasian, how do you say it? Bo Boasian? Boasian. Boasian approach. However, since then, the world has changed and anthropology has changed too. Though for those of us who belong to indigenous communities, the discipline probably hasn't changed as much as we would have liked it to. In the 21st century, holistic anthropolo anthropological community studies have now given way to more thematically focused investigations, including categories such as identity, globalization, public policy, and cosmopolitanism. Categories such as, or, or specializations such as medical anthropology, environmental anthropology, legal anthropology, and legal anthropology. The discipline also analyzes and makes space for concrete issues such as HIV AIDS, emerging elderly populations, climate change, militarization, and war. In my experience of anthropology, indigenous anthropology as a disciplinary specialization has the potential to transform power relations for those of us who are indigenous stakeholders in the discipline. In the face of anthropology at home, Māori communities and scholars have asserted themselves politically and culturally and, rap and radically influenced New Zealand's academic mainstream. One glaring example in New Zealand is that now our most prestigious research grants, and remember I'm a research fellow, so I don't teach like a lot of you, I actually don't do any teaching, it's a luxury job. Uh, most prestigious research grants require applicant researchers that want to conduct research in Māori communities or on topics that Māori have interest in to write a vision mā tauranga statement. So a vision mā tauranga statement is a special piece in the application where you have to say, you know, this is how it's going to affect Māori. Um, this statement must explain the research project's capacity and contribution to Māori people and Māori knowledge, while vision mā tauranga, while vision mā tauranga Compliance is sometimes considered to be lip service and tokenism. It forces research applicants into a space where they must articulate the ethical benefits of, our, of their research to Māori New Zealanders. Graham McRae, who heads Massey's Albany Anthropology Program, explains in a recent work that in the late 1980s and 90s, Māori-trained anthropologists critiqued intellectual colonisation and Māori studies and anthropology parted ways. He raises the idea for the upcoming New Zealand Anthropology Conference next week that today Māori studies and th anthropology remain like former lovers, wondering what has been lost and what has been gained and how best to maintain or hopefully be rebuild our whānau or family relationship. I think this is an amiable way of describing the deep tensions that exist between anthropology, anthropologists, Māori scholars and Māori communities in New Zealand. The neoliberalisation that has reached every corner of the globe and people's lives has flavoured much of our contemporary anthropology. Last year, before the University of Auckland reschooled its arts faculty, Māori studies were directed to realign with anthropology. The Māori studies staff response to this proposition was along the lines of, hell will free, let hell freeze over first. Some of the anthropologists unobtrusively bit back with, whew, that was a narrow escape, thank goodness for that. At my university, we have moved from a world of departments understood in anthropological terms as semi-autonomous chiefdoms um, that were ruled by chairs to programs that have been disempowered within multidisciplinary schools or academic units. Retired anthropologist Harry Allen commented on the effects of reschooling re on anthropology and put it this way, the heart of anthropology has been ripped out. Yet on the other side of the coin, there are those critics who think the anthropologists have got what they deserve. <laughs> 
They never humbled themselves to the emerging disciplines. They ignored them and remained devout to a purely objective and academic anthropology. Back in 1998, Paul Salito warned, anthropologists need to pay attention or other disciplines will supplant it. Already the agricultural economists and human geographers, even foresters and plant pathologists are stealing our disciplinary clothes. I work in one of the University of Auckland's independent research centres. We do not sit within a particular, particular university faculty. As a Māori environmental anthropologist at the James Henare Māori Research Centre, my research is informed and enriched by my position within two distinct cultures. Firstly, I am often an insight I am often an insider of the culture I am studying, and my research by its very nature is Māori-related research. My research projects often reflect the key principles of kaupapa Māori research, talked about by Linda Smith, yeah, which is dependent on my being Māori, is underpinned by Māori philosophy and principles, takes for granted the validity and legitimacy of a Māori worldview, and is fundamentally concerned with the struggle for autonomy over Māori well-being. However, my research also draws on anthropological methods and theory, which enables me to offer new angles of vision and depths of understanding to existing anthropological scholarship that has often privileged Western knowledge in its examination of other cultures. As an anthropologist, I have been exposed to many Western theories which I have begun to extend and apply in a Maori context. In brief, this blending of knowledge and ideas has provided me with a more sophisticated way of thinking, of understanding Maori and I also work with Mapuche and Mohawk as well. So those ones as well, those peoples as well. Relationships to land and resources. So I wonder, uh, might these experiences that I have contribute to establishing and delineating an indigenous anthropology? Kia ora. Thanks, Maroma. Next, we have Darren Rankle, Chair of Native American Programs at the University of Maine. All right, good morning. Thank you to the organizers of this panel for including me. Uh, thanks for all for coming. And um, I, was, I, did, I, was, I missed it, but I, thanks to the indigenous leaders who welcome us to the territory. And, that's a really important step forward for the anthropology conference to do. So I'll, I'll try to keep this, I'm gonna cut out all my jokes, I, I swear, and I will get to this in seven minutes. Um, the overall thrust of this panel is one uh, not just focus on the possibility of an indigenous-oriented anthropology, but one in which we try to use anthropology for healing, or as my favorite Maliseed anthropologist, Bernie Perley, writes to engage practices of self-determination against daily traumas of colonial domination. I, like many of my colleagues here today, see anthropology, like the concept of culture, to be a somewhat flexible and competed for domain of interests and networks. Thus, our ability to indigenize it, whether through praxis, epistemology, or some other means, you know, completely under erasure, uh, require a keen understanding and disruption of power relationships. As part of this discussion, as the roundtable description points out, an element that hangs over our heads is the perception that we as, an indigenous, as indigenous anthropologists are somewhat involved with our communities, families, and indigenous activists in the misrepresentation of indigenous cultures through strategic essentialisms. People have mentioned the critiques by Cooper. There have been a whole host of them. I always like it when an anthropologist comes to me and says, um, well, that's strategic essentialism, and I don't want to play devil's advocate, but, you know, it's like, I'm not a racist, but um, I love devil advocate people. That's a real great thing. Sorry, frowny face. I'm going to skip through things. In 2006, I pointed to the ways in which an indigenous anthropology disrupts anthropological narratives, which I referred to metaphorically as hunting stories, and asked what kind of narrative, be it contingent, open for discussion, and critical this would lead to. I also carved out a space for an indigenous anthropology that can further the ethical and moral standards of all anthropological practice, both through narrative and a series of relationships. I still believe in this project. Now, after working six miles from my indigenous nation for six years, I would say nine years after writing this paper, this is really about me and sort of my intellectual development. <laughs> um, 
I doubled down on the potential of indigenous framing of anthropological questions that seek new, area, new areas of inquiry and mobilizations of knowledge and mutually beneficial collaborations and controls uh, other forms of inquiry and controls other forms of inquiry based on tribal declarations of sovereignty and nation building. I also recognize that often urgent need for forms of cultural modeling that address tribal cultural and historic preservation projects and these possibly reflect older or outdated forms of anthropological practice. The discussions around indigenous nation building which should be by and large happening within our tribal nations should keep us focused and not let us reify concepts such as community. Um, and other, other frowny face for me is that moving home, and I would make a joke about this, but community is you know, both the love and bane of my existence um, as someone working in a university, but it is ultimately the critical discussion around nationhood. So how to think about or act or process in indigenous anthropology. So much of what I do in my current job in involves a, a way of saying yes to activities or scholarship that enhances indigenous nation building. This involves a lot of brokering, building relationships and finding common ground between the university, the state, federal administrative agencies and tribal communities. I believe in indigenous, this is where I say I'm a sellout, sorry. I believe in, in, in indigenous anthropology includes this this brokering to achieve things like cooperative agreements between universities and tribal IRBs, uh, collections, and so forth, as well as MOUs between tribal governments, federal and state forestry agencies seeking to control invasive pests that are threatening critical cultural and natural resources in my state. And these are just two of the projects that I'm currently involved in that are brokering really important uh, issues for the communities. That said, strategic discussions that have taken place within the Penobscot Nation that I've been a part of uh, reflect a sophistication that fully understands the ways in which we are sometimes forced to use old anthropological models to fight for and preserve uh, our sovereignty. Um, that it is strategic. <laughs> so the idea that it is bad or wrong that there's strategic essentialisms is also part of the slippage Bernie talks about. And, and lastly, as much as I love to critique the colonial and settler imaginaries that served to sever us further from our ancestors and historical experiences, I love that. Uh, and indigenous anthropology seeks so much more than critique. Healing reflects collective responsibility that is so critical to indigenous nation building and orients us towards action that respects process and maintains and expands relationships. Thank you. Next up, we have Kehalani Kowanui, Associate Professor of American Studies and Anthropology at Wesleyan University. Aloha kakahiaka. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for attending our session. Mahalo to the organizers and also to all the co-participants. I'm really excited to be here and to be part of this gathering. I um, want to just... Um, I want to say a few things and then I'd like to around the category of indigeneity and also the concept of indigenous anthropology and then I'll just shift briefly to talk about some of the work um, that I've been doing and what I've encountered in terms of that kind of engagement between um, an independent media radio show, a service learning course and a book project that I'm just wrapping up at least in terms of the initial drafting of it. I think um, for me what's been really um, surreal twilight zone about dipping back into the different series of Cooper debates that have come and gone over the last um, decade plus is it reminds me so much of the early 90s debates between Roger Keesing, Haunani K. Trask, Jocelyn Linekin, and eventually uh, Margaret Jolly in terms of the invention of tradition and the notion of charging people engaged in political battle and forms of nationalism of inventing the past and to being uh, charges of being instrumentalist and essentialist. And so, you know, to kind of revisit all the debates in preparation for this, I felt like I was sort of being transported back in time to my undergraduate days. I also just want to cop to um, my own ambivalence around um, engaging the discipline. I, um, I teach in anthropology. I have a joint appointment in that department at Wesleyan University as well as American Studies, but I have doctorates in neither. 
and I'm thoroughly undisciplined. I started at community college in the 80s and I transferred to Berkeley as a philosophy student and quickly fled to women's studies and ethnic studies and then did a year and a half in Maori studies at Auckland University uh, for a year and a half at the master's level and then earned my doctorate in history of consciousness. And, you know, so I, I don't say sort of emphatically I'm an anthropologist. I don't identify that as such, even though I identify with the discipline at times. It's not necessarily part of my professional identity. And so when I was invited onto the session, I really started to think about what that ambivalence means for me and thinking about the legacy of anthropology in Hawaii. And even as an undergraduate, you know, I kind of dipped in. I took a course from Iowa Ong, and there was an amazing um, group of scholars there, as there are now, although there's some differences. And anthropology was, and in many ways still is, just a dirty word in Hawaii. And I really felt that as an undergraduate, so much so that I didn't feel like I could actually even major in it as an undergrad, to be honest. And I, um, I think Taika Vikatengan being the first Kanaka Maoli doctorate in anthropology at UH. Kehau Abad was the first in Taika Vikatengan. The first two um, Kanaka Maoli PhD students in the University of Hawaii says a lot, but also that they are really doing that kind of important uh, cutting edge work to transform what that means and what that can mean in terms of possibility intellectually and politically. I think too about um, the importance of indigenous revitalization and those charges and the epistemological slip that you mentioned, Bernie. I was also reflecting on the ways in which Jocelyn Lenikin's work was used by the military in the court case over the bombing of Koho'olawe Island um, in which she had cited in some of her early work that the concept of aloha aina, love of the land, was an invented tradition in the 70s. And it wasn't until really two decades later that we found through the work of Kanaka Maoli political scientist Noe Noe Silva, um, who uncovers sort of a, a hidden genealogy of nationalist resistance at the turn of the century, that one of the most prominent nationalist groups fighting U.S. annexation was called Hui Aloha Aina. Right? And that group falls out of public memory. The myths still per are pervasive. If you go to the McKinley statue in Honolulu, under his, his arm it says Treaty of Annexation. And yet it was Hui Aloha Aina and Hui Kala Aina that actually defeated the Treaty of Annexation in the U.S. Senate in 1897. So again, those kinds of erasures um, are things that I think uh, indigenous anthropology att att attends to and must in terms of the importance of indigenous revitalization. In other words, it was through Noe Noe Silva's um, adult training in Hawaiian language that enabled her to do this incredibly important primary research to even uncover the work of these nationalist organizations that had literally been relegated to footnotes. And so in a sense, we don't even know what we don't know, right? and there are just literally um, over 70 Hawaiian language newspapers uh, at the time of the US overth overthrow, and it's indigenous scholars um, primarily who have been learning Hawaiian language as adults who are actually getting into the archives because our ancestors left an amazing archive for us, um, for those that are fortunate enough to learn and be able to access. I, um, in terms of the kind of work that I think qualifies as indigenous anthropology, I was thinking about an in an independent media show that I did for seven years at the campus station WESU in Middletown, Connecticut, and that is Indigenous Politics from Native New England and Beyond, and I served as a sole producer and host of the show. And I put that forth because I wasn't sort of bound to, by the sort of framework of being a journalist, because I'm not, but it was definitely an explicitly advocacy project, uh, applied anthropology, if you will, and one that I felt was important as a Kanaka Maoli woman living in Native America to be attentive to what was going on and what still is going on actually, especially the anti-Indian um, movements emanating from New England. And so thinking about that in terms of ethical obligations, uh, radical relationality of dealing um, with what it means to live on someone else's homeland and educating the broader public around the political struggles that tribes have been dealing with. And it was that show that actually led me to do a service learning course that I'm engaged in right now called Decolonizing Indigenous Middletown. And part of that was my quest to try and learn about the Wangunk Indian people who have been completely written out of history. They were said to have 
you know, been vanished by the time of the American Revolution. And even finding out the name of the people whose land I was on was very challenging and took quite a while once I moved to Middletown, also known as Mattabesset, the traditional name, um, 15 plus years ago. And I have connected with um, an extended family and the tribal genealogist of the line that never left. And so I'm working with students at the Middlesex uh, County Historical Society to uncover the early settler documents on Langunk Indian to address um, not just the erasure of their history, but the history of their erasure. Um, I wanna shift gears really quickly in terms of what little time I have left to kind of mark how I'm thinking about indigenous anthropology and some of the contradictions that might arise. I'm right now um, completing a book monograph called Thy Kingdom Come, with a question mark, Paradoxes of Hawaiian Sovereignty that is a critical engagement with Hawaiian statist nationalism, um, a particular branch of the Hawaiian independence movement, and looking at some of the contradictory political claims that arise when uh, indigenous peoples are still subordinated under international law to states and the rule of Westphalian sovereignty that's, you know, that's promulgated and premised on the doctrine of Christian discovery. And I'm thinking here of uh, Stephen Newcomb's work in particular that really you know, refuses to even call it the doctrine of discovery, but insists that it is the doctrine of Christian discovery, and it's a form of on ongoing Zionism into the 21st century that uh, states continue, especially the United States, but not exclusively, continue to actually rely on medieval Christian law to dictate the, the social location and political status of indigenous peoples. And of course, that's not just in US federal policy, that's also totally enshrined still today in international law that purports to be secular. And so thinking about the, you know, the ways in which the enduring concept of the savage heathen um, is completely um, codified and rules. And so you know, when I think about the, de the Cooper debate, you know, I'm thinking, who's really living in the past, right? Delirium indeed. Uh, you've got um, forms of Zionism um, that I think demand a critique of the state. And this is where sort of my anarchist queer sensibilities come in in terms of looking at the role of indigenous resurgence and revitalization that we can't wait for the state. And also looking at what Hawaiian elites had to forfeit in the early 19th century to secure independent state status that is the Hawaiian kingdom in relation to land, gender, and sexuality and what that means today in contemporary kingdom nationalist claims. And this is all happening in the face of a federally and state-driven um, push to contain Hawaiian national claims under international law within US federal policy. Some of you may be familiar with the Akaka Bill or the um, Native Hawaiian Government Reorganization Act that was before Congress for 12 years and was defeated by Republicans. And so what's happened is you have state actors actually now making an end run around the legislative process and going through the Department of the Interior that just announced two months ago that they're gonna make a special rule just for Hawaiians to get federally recognized. And yet I'm living in New England where tribes haven't even been able to meet, um, the, even when they've met the threshold, they've been denied federal recognition. And here you've got state actors driving it. And so, you, you know, these are really, there's some strict uh, confinement in terms of what one can do, whether it's the state model of federal recognition like tribal entities, or, you know, the prospect of, of calling on international law for an independent Hawaiian state claim. And so I'm, I'm really critical of both of those, but also the, the idea that we can't wait for any state and to think through the resurgence of indigenous knowledge and uh, different forms of ontologies that can deal with that healing and address uh, intergenerational trauma as well as confront sort of the internalized racism of um, dealing with our savage pasts, if you will. Thank you. Uh, Professor Jume Wingle, who's on the schedule, was unable, unable to join us um, today, but we're um, keeping him in our thoughts. Um, next up, we have uh, Dr. Merata Kafuru, Associate Professor at the Te Tumu School of Maori Pacific and Indigenous Studies at the University of Otago, and also Director of the James Henare Research Center at the University of Auckland. Um, thanks very much for coming to this massive room with so many lights. I don't think I've ever spoken in a room this big with so many lights and almost feel I should do a hucker or something like that. So apologies, not going to. 
Um, I'd also just like to acknowledge Ty and Bernie for bringing us together. I mean, I think I can count on one hand the number of times Indigenous anthropologists have come together. So it's a real honour for me. So thank you. Uh, I'd like to also acknowledge the Tangata Whenua, of course, the local people, Shaya Narapaho and Kaiowa, Narere Tena Koto Katoa. And being a typical Indigenous anthropologist, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Professor Paul Tapsell and Hirini Tani. Um, we debated and discussed these ideas over the last few days about what I'm going to say this morning. So Indigenous not doing things by themselves as an individual, but as a group. <laughs> Okay, so just to start, um, some general comments here. As humans, as a civilization, we are hardwired to form groups, to organize ourselves and to be social. So when we talk about indigenous or indigeneity, indigene and those kinds of terms, we might be interested in understanding uniquely indigenous value systems, patterns, worldviews, et cetera, that you know, define, shape, or mold our social groups or rather our communities. And of course, one community's reality is going to be unique to themselves in terms of their worldview and how those views, are values are going to be applied. A unique point of difference of indigenous anthropologists then <coughs> is going to be something like perhaps to interpret, to understand and to communicate this reality reflexively as an insider who operates within an implicit understanding of the checks and balances of the kinship system, of which she or he is part, and as a co-creator of community knowledge. Broadly, you could call this an indigenous anthropological lens. Now, does this notion, indigenous anthropological lens, really work in the kinds of ways I've just outlined? I just want to diverge for a moment and briefly comment on the notion indigenous and actually I just want to acknowledge everything that has been said, There's, everything that's been said is actually covered in what I'm about to say really, really well. It's really refreshing to hear these sort of views all in one morning. I think it has taken about 20 years for me to hear these sorts of things in one go, so thank you. Indigenous is a macro, broad or mega category. It is a bit of a, as we would say, a catch-all. It is an approximation and it is abstract. It is not, at least in New Zealand, used by community people, our people, Māori, in day-to-day -day affairs or in communication. And those who, of us who are Māori and anthropologists don't really, I suppose, run around too often calling ourselves indigenous anthropologists, um, except perhaps in these international kind of contexts um, where it really matters. But for this international inter-ethnic context to matter, it does so only when we are clear about how an indigenous anthropological lens works on the ground. Of course, there is no singular approach in practice, and there never will be. But there are some key important elements that I think are relevant um, and which stand out to one extent or another. These are concerned with the kinds of things that I sort of started off with. <clears throat> of course, there are many others but as just opening comments in for um, this morning's brief discussion, I just want to um, summarize three key areas. Again, some of the things I have already touched on. And so for me, at least our small part of the world in New Zealand, it, it's important to use these things to be reflexive, but more importantly, it's important to be accountable when we're doing anthropology, to be accountable and to serve our local communities at the same time, and yeah, I heard your comments about, <laughs> oh my goodness, being indigenous, being an anthropologist and being part of a community. It's more than a seven day a week job. <laughs> um, and so you're serving your local communities at the same time as being an anthropologist within this relationship, within a relationship matrix between ourselves, our communities. Um, and you know, there are other kinds of relationships as well between the living, um, our Tupuna ancestors, those that have passed on and so on. So that's sort of a broad context of relationships. The second is to extend the practice of co-creation of knowledge, analysis and outcomes. And you know, of course, this isn't necessarily any different to what some anthropologists might already be doing 
But the point here is that it is a critical and central practice, um, at least in the, in the Māori community, in the Māori world that I live in. This is co-creation. It's not as us coming in as anthropologists into the communities and then defining what that informational knowledge or analysis is. It is a co-creative, collaborative exercise of um, knowledge creation. And a third indigenous anthropological approach, or perhaps contribution to anthropology more broadly, um, had, as a counter also, I, I say, um, to anthropological frames, is our own development of our own theory and our own theories. Ones that help to interpret what's happening on the ground, what, is, um, what has happened on the ground, and what could or should happen on the ground as well. And so back in New Zealand, in our small part of the world, this is a direct response to the problematic of healing anthropological deliriums. We are developing our own so-called indigenous theories. And so in simple terms, this theory is for us uh, a structuring of the, the human material um, and non-material realms. It explains and centralizes relationships, and I've just tried to emphasize that point a moment ago, between the living, the past, and the future. It's a cross-generational kind of way of looking at things. And it's also about looking at and emphasizing relationships of other kinds, social, political, economic, um, environmental natures, and so on. This framework also, in this context of these multiple relationships and layers, um, provides that context for looking at those constraints and opportunities uh, for relationships to sustain, to develop, and so on. Briefly, we would call this our whakapapa theory. This is where we start when we want to, quote, get at or understand the realities of our people and their, quote, social groups. <coughs> it works as a frame for investigating issues like language revitalization uh, and the constraints and opportunities for it, and also for economic innovation and development, all sorts of things. And I just want to throw this in as a, as a final comment. Um, there's something else that we're kind of interested in New Zealand, I like to do things a little bit differently in terms of indigenous social anthropology. It is pretty simply this. We're interested in integrating Western anthropological theory approaches or thought into our own theory. I just briefly outlined our, the kinds of approaches or theories that we have in mind. It is a kind of an anthropological reversal, if you like, i.e. it's us, indigenous people, looking outward, studying the other, or the Western, and bringing those ideas into our world on our terms in ways that make sense and that are going to be useful. Kia ora mai tato. And finally, we have Lisa Uparasa from the University of Hoiamano in the Departments of Ethnic Studies and Sociology. Talofa, thank you all for joining us um, at this session. And I also wanted to thank, especially Ty and Bernie, for organizing and bringing us all together. And my fellow, fellow panelists for all the wonderful um, knowledge that they've shared with us so far. So I have a, a short piece that I want to share with you all. And it comes in part from uh, my position having been trained in anthropology, but being appointed in ethnic studies and sociology for the past four and a half years at University of Hawaii Manoa, um, and then using two examples to think through um, some of the larger issues that we're talking about today. Over the past few decades, scholars have posed serious challenges to politics of knowledge production in anthropology and the academy more widely. In the wake of critiques of Orientalism and representation, the articulation of indigenous methodologies, and the exploration of indigenous epistemologies not to mention critiques of whiteness and white privilege, we might assume a new, more inclusive time in anthropology has begun. Drawing on a recent collaboration and over a decade of experience as a member, um, including four years as a board member and one as chair of an international anthropological scholarly organization, um, I explore here the continuing dynamics of objectification and marginalization of indigenous Pacific scholars 
in and through the claiming of scholarship and scholarly organizations as white public space. And so here I'm drawing on Brodkin, Hutchinson, and Morgan. The first example I'll describe briefly and generally, uh, which was uh, had to do with the writing collaboration uh, with a senior colleague that I had to pull out of earlier this year after finally facing some misgivings that I had had for a while about the project. Um, and I thought through them when I was at home uh, in the field this summer. The misgivings centered on recognizing our differential positioning and the way that has not only shaped our research process, access to interlocutors and analysis, but also the way it would likely shape reception of our respective book projects, our research um, agendas, when they're published. In short and bluntly, I realized that even though I had begun my re research earlier um, with the community that I still consider home, collaborating with the senior white professor would likely position um, this person as my mentor and authority on the topic we were both researching. As a white Western academic, the reception of the researcher in Samoa fell into a longer history of according expertise and status um, to the learned foreigner racialized as white. As I reflected on my misgivings, I understood that the researcher was not bound by cultural protocols of respect, uh, acknowledgement of hierarchy and gendered expectations that I had struggled with throughout my graduate um, training, research, and continue to. Um, the researcher was also not bound by community expectations and eventual opinion, not only shaping how the work would be communicated to the public, but in future expectations of service to the wider community from the position within the university. As I wrote about in our earlier 2010 collaboration with Ty and others while doing my graduate research, this weight of expectation can be particularly fraught for our junior researchers. Um, and this has been confirmed to be my many, many conversations uh, with uh, junior Pacific scholars and graduate students um, over the past, I don't know, five to seven years, both in my institution and in many other institutions. Okay, so in short, uh, the researcher was not bound by the community in any way, shape, or form, um, but what I wanted to think through here is not just that particular relationship, but our location in the academy, um, ideas, sort of racialized ideas about expertise and sort of access and reception. And I actually personally really like this person, but I wanted to think through how we're positioned differently. So at my time at uh, University of Hawaii has taught me many things about being a Pacific academic trained in anthropology, living, working, and researching in our linked communities. And I think like Kehalani, I entered anthropology as a graduate student already ambivalent about the legacy of anthropology in the Pacific, but also in Samoa in particular. Um, and it was a dirty word and probably still remains a dirty word in our community. So we can talk about that later. Um, in particular, my time at UH has reinforced to me the importance of positionality and the way it shapes our research process and writing. And this was already evident by some of um, early drafting and sort of talks I had seen in terms of the, the other analysis that was being developed. So in terms of disciplinary dynamics, I think anthropology, um, probably in part because of the reflexive turn and because of it calls for, calls for accountability um, by scholars within and outside of the discipline, at least has a growing strain of awareness on these points and is engaging these points. I mean, in the fact that we're up here today in this very large room, I think um, engaging it in a way that other disciplines um, are not necessarily um, doing, and it's not even actually on the radar. And, and that I'm happy to, to discuss a little bit more later. Um, but here, I'm also referring to the compulsion to be legible and to privilege a more conventional mainstream approach to scholarship, uh, which are named as a norm, but which also constitute a legacy of largely white Western thought. Okay, in the second example, um, it came from an email on a listserv, and I, I chose it because both of these examples um, are not kind of isolated, but they are exemplary of the things that I have seen and observed um, in our subfield, Pacific Anthropology, but also um, more widely being involved in the discipline. So in the email, a scholar was preparing to do a talk in a Pacific Island country and anticipated being asked, why is it always you studying us? Um, noting that one, one dimension of the issue pertains to um, Pacific Islanders taking up anthropology, this person was asking the group to furnish them with names of scholars of Pacific ancestry who do or have done field research outside their home countries or outside the Pacific Islands in general. 
And I'd actually missed this email first time around because I just tend to avoid lists of, um, a lot of listservs. It's just too much email. Um, but I had been alerted to this particular uh, thread, um, partly because mine had been forwarded on others um, as part of the 24 email responses in the chain. And so when I looked at the thread, I was, um, I think appalled is probably the right word. Um, not only was it obviously participating in the objectification of scholars of Pacific ancestry, the thread was oblivious to the kinds of critiques that would generate the hypothetical question in the first place. So it's therefore revealing that in a later response, um, the original writer of the email noted, you know, basically thanking everybody for their continuing thoughts and information on Pacific Islander anthropologists, and that that information would be very useful um, should a question arise um, about who studies whom. So it was revealing in the first place that um, the person was not familiar with some of the scholarship that was being suggested. Um, but moreover, the solicitation it seemed was made not out of a genuine desire to learn more about the scholarship of indigenous Pacific anthropologists, but rather the request was made in preparation to deflect a question that at its heart is about privilege and power relations in the production of knowledge. The unwillingness to prepare to engage this question in a thoughtful manner strikes at the central dividing issue I see in the subfield of Pacific anthropology. And that unwillingness at this moment um, must be named as white academic privilege. So these, as I said, these two examples are not isolated, but are rather um, exemplary. And um, in preparation for coming to the meeting, I was following a lot of the emergence of the anti-racist um, campus activism and the, re the reactions to that, all of that all over the news has been um, occupying for the last couple of weeks. And um, one of the things that I saw written by Eduardo Bonilla Silva, Silva who writes about color racism and colorblind racism in the US, and one of his comments um, was talking about historically white colleges and universities and the ways in which admitting racialized um, minority students and faculty didn't fundamentally shift the structure of the institution, um, its curriculum, its canon, et cetera. And so these faculty and students were coming as guests who were expected to kind of uh, not only behave themselves, but to adapt to the institution that they were entering. So this um, struck me as connected to the, this, um, this difficulty that I'm, I'm discussing, right? This continuing disconnect in anthropology, and particularly in our subfields where the challenge of racialized minority and indigenous scholars, indigenous knowledge, and control over knowledge production is strong. Anthropology was not only built on studying the native, um, and in that study, claiming expert status that requires the subject to remain subjected. It is part of the wider world of academia that remains a site of systemic white privilege and advantage from boards of regents to donors to administrators, faculty, curriculum, norms, values, et cetera. So without a commitment to anti-racist practice and engaging these questions of power and power relations, it will remain so, and we will uh, continue to have these eruptions when systemic racism is called out. Um, so by way of closing, uh, I wanted to pick up on one of the prompts of this round table. Um, can this discussion provide the critical catalyst for the emergence of an indigenous anthropology that signals the end of imperial anthropology? And I think that there are some very promising practices. Um, I have taken a lot of inspiration, um, for example, from uh, Ty's work, um, especially um, in terms of thinking about reading indigenous indi idioms with and against Western imaginaries of epistemology and ontology, um, which is something I do in my own work um, thinking through both the cultural framing and capitalist framework of football in Samoa, for example. Um, and so I, I hope in the, the discussion and Q&A we get a chance to talk a little bit more about this. Um, but I do want to say that the pressure to render understandings of indigenous worlds or worlds framed by radical difference within the constraints of Western culture theory um, is still present, it's intense, and that pressure is framed by dynamics which continue to produce anthropology as white public space. All right, at this time, um, I'll invite our 
panelists to move a little bit closer to the table, we're going to engage in some crosstalk and dialogue here um, in response to the, the various provocations and ideas that were offered up in this first round. Um, and then uh, shortly after that, we'll open it up to other comments and questions from the audience. Is that good? Yeah. Okay. As I think about uh, what the panelists have shared with all of us, uh, one of the themes that keep coming up is uh, a tension between the discipline and our experiences. And this was echoed, uh, well, it was uh, also part of the conversation yesterday with the uh, student uh, panel. And uh, it's so often that you hear when uh, our experience going into anthropology is not really a comfortable or welcoming experience. So imagine sometime in the second decade of the 21st century, two indigenous students are making their way across the kind of bureaucratic forest of a university, and they come into this clearing, and it's the anthropology department, okay? And so, <laughs> This first indigenous student, <laughs> this first indigenous student says, look, we found science. And the second one says, no, we found culture. And, uh, and then Adam Cooper comes around the corner and says, no, you found truth and knowledge. Mm -hmm. Okay, now I highlight that because one of the things that uh, a lot of the students and a lot of our experiences have been as we go through this process we call anthropology, we are being disciplined. And I promise you this is a true story. When I was contesting a grade in my graduate career, the graduate advisor says, Bernie, Anthropology is a discipline, and you're being disciplined. And I think this is something that we have to continue to grapple with today. Adam Cooper is still out there, and this is where we have to keep pushing back. And I think some of the comments that you know, uh, had been shared here really kind of highlight that ongoing tension. And this is why I wanted to focus on this idea of this kind of emergent praxis, because in these conversations, we're starting that you know, larger uh, reformation of not only how we perceive anthropology, but also how we can uh, adjust the discipline uh, not to be just, you know, uh, what do you call it, um, giving us the opportunity and space. Again, it's a white privilege that they have. Oh, well, we can entertain the indigenous voices. Is it possible? And I'd like the uh, uh, panelists to talk about this. Is it possible really, really, to shape shift, to discipline from our particular experiences? Yes. <laughs> I, I tried to be the most Pollyanna of the group. Um, it, it, just to question what you're asking, Bernie, are, are you saying that, um, I mean, without some sort of radical power, you know, revolution kind of thing. Um, I think that as we, ex I mean, self-consciously, uh, as we exist as indigenous anthropologists, you know, uh, on a fringe, right? Self-consciously, um, the fact that we, I think, uh, the idea that we would code switch or, or, or do some sort of strategic use of anthropology for a particular um, you know, indigenous nation and should not be a surpri surprise. I think you know, trying to then fashion a space and create the slippage that you talked about, I think is one of the, you know, it's a challenge that needs allies. It's a challenge that needs um, you know, some, something more than you know, a paternalistic like pat on the head, which um, as being someone in <laughs> who went to grad school with you, like 
That's not even the worst story you could possibly say about what they told Bernie in grad school. It's always good that Bernie was a space clearer. And, uh, um, yeah, so that'd be my response. I think I'll leave. Yes, <laughs> as well. Um, yeah, I think so, and that's a very important question for the wider discipline, for not just us as the boxed anthropological, no, the indigenous anthropologist here on stage, but it's for a discussion for everybody, I think. That's one approach. But for us, I think, too, um, and I think these are the kind of ideas that we've all been talking about in some way or another, is just to go alone and do our own thing and not necessarily call it anthropology. And we, we were just talking a moment ago about, isn't it funny we can call ourselves indigenous anthropologists? Isn't that a bit of an oxymoron in a way as well? So, therefore, isn't it a good idea to perhaps, you know, just do our own thing? And that's what Marta and I are doing in our own indigenous uh, research school or whatever it is, and we look up to the anthropology department on the eighth floor. Kia ora, hello up there. We're just getting on with it, you know, kia ora, Cooper. Gosh, it's actually been really good to rethink about um, Cooper in the last few days, few weeks, is, it, yeah, brought me back 20 years. <laughs> but I read the first few pages of his book as, you know, my core text and put it down and went to my father as an anthropologist and said, what the heck's he talking about, Dad? Makes no sense whatsoever. And he said, never mind. You just read one or two chapters and come up with your own ideas. So, kia ora. Um, I, too, will say yes, but I feel like there are a couple of different um, sort of sites and sort of scales if we think about shifting that shape of anthropology. And so um, in the subfield and the organization that I was talking about, one of the things that we've been doing, and I feel like the, the comments that I made should be hashtag like not all anthropologists, um, in the sense that shifting a shape is possible. It requires allies, it requires a lot of work and a lot of strategy, right? So from thinking about uh, changing the kind of structure or culture of meeting, sort of making small interventions to make spaces like that open and more welcoming to non-white scholars, right? So at, at the very basic level. Um, but then also keeping in mind that just the presence in the room at the table also shifts the shape of conversations. And so in terms of like the ripple effect on the wider discipline, I don't know, it'll probably take a lot a lot longer than I've even been in the discipline to see from kind of uh, looking back perspective, but I definitely uh, have hope. Um, I'll just say yes as well, and I say yes because I'm coming from a place of having had a postdoc in an anthropology department where I was really disciplined. I got disciplined to death. Um, after the postdoc, I felt really, as a student, I was actually nurtured, but as a, as a staff member in a department, it, it wasn't a very nice experience for me. And, so the option that my university gave me was to go and work in the Māori Research Centre because they didn't know what to do with me. And I thought, oh, God, I don't want to go down there with all the Māoris. And it freaked me out. Well, being down there with all the Māoris was the best thing that ever happened to me. So I got disciplined by anthropology, and they taught me some wonderful skills. And I'm going to be very honest that some of my closest friends are still in that anthropology department. Some of my closest international friends come from anthropology and they've been extremely supportive and they haven't been indigenous. Um, so I think that anthropology itself is a very complex thing and it's one of those disciplines where you often act as an individual. And so individuals have their own agendas and so it's not purely just this, oh, they're racist. I don't think it's that at all, I think. There are all sorts of uh, personal agendas that people have. Some people can be very generous. Some people are extremely competitive and don't want to see you pass them because you're indigenous and they think that you have the step ahead of them. Some people are, um, like to hold on to territory and only like to work with people that are just like them. And so my, and there's also a, a, a subtle class thing that runs through anthropology. So I'm not gonna sit here and say that anthropologists are racist because I don't think they are. I think it is far more complex than that. However, going to the Māori Research Centre was extremely liberating. I found my colleagues there, we knew the boundaries of what was appropriate. You know, we had the tribal connections, but we were also 
doing our own thing. We don't tend to butt our nose into one another's business. We just let one another get on with it. And um, so my experience now where I don't teach, which is a bit of a shame because I'm actually a good teacher, um, but doing pure research uh, has been liberating for me. And I actually think I'm in the very best anthropological space. I'm in the best Māori space. I'm in the best anthro space. I get to do environmental anthropology. And so I think Mirata and I are cutting out a new way of being an anthropologist, moving away from you know, departments and units, but actually finding our own sovereignty, our own tinoranga tiratanga. So we, I think we're actually pushing boundaries that have not been pushed before. Kia ora. Um, I just, I wanted to kind of riff a little bit off of what you said, Lisa, in terms of thinking through multiple interventions, and this sort of dovetails with your point around the, the, the Henari Research Center. Just thinking in terms of not necessarily in relation to the discipline in that grand way, but thinking through project-based interventions, I think, for me, is part of where it's at, right? And I think so much of it is about thinking through the, the, the issues around enduring white supremacy and, and colonialism in the discipline in terms of who's seen as a, you know, can be more than a native informant in terms of the authoritative piece, but also that community accountability that you mentioned is so important. I do want to say, um, a couple other quick things. I mean, for, for the grad students out there, you know, I always tell people that I'm talking to at other institutions, because I'm, I'm with undergrads at Wesleyan. You know, you're there to get trained, not tamed. And there is a difference. And I think it's really important for people to follow, you know, in Hawaiian, we talk about the na'al, the gut, and that's that, that intuition. And I say, you know, follow your intellectual intuition. Um, but also, I do want to acknowledge that where I am actually has some really nice kind of differences in terms of anthropology at Wesleyan. When I first was on the market and applied for the job, in American Studies owned the line, owns the line that I actually um, occupy, for lack of a better word, at Wesleyan. And American Studies wasn't yet a department, and so they were compelled to actually shop around with the department. And at that time, only um, disciplines were departments. So anthropology actually was a good fit, but that had more to do with the work that people were doing inside that already was friendly to interdisciplinarity. So this is when Susan Hirsch was still there and does you know, amazing legal anthropology. Elizabeth Traub, who's done some incredible work in East Timor, had already started doing also cultural studies and media studies. And so there was an opening. And the year after I came in, Anu Sharma and Gina Ulysse were hired and all of us had joint appointments. So Gina at that time was jointly appointed with African American <coughs> Studies, Anu Sharma with then Women's Studies, which later was renamed to Feminist Gender and Sexuality Studies, and then myself in American Studies. So I do want to acknowledge that I feel um, that I'm in a, a really supportive um, particular department in terms of collegiality and intellectual rapport. But the other piece around the shape-shifting question, I think there's so much baseline when we hear these questions about the, the email exchange or the, the senior scholar that you're working with. I mean, I think about the ongoing battle for NAGPRA compliance all over the world, but in this country where anthropology departments have often used, you know, loopholes to try and withhold the return of human remains, items of cultural patrimony and sacred objects. And I, you know, when I was an undergrad at Berkeley, the Native American Graves Protection Repatriation Act had just passed. And the first federal test case, as many of you hopefully know, was the Native Hawaiian case at Cal Berkeley. And that happened while I was there. And thinking through the political economy of it, when the head of archaeology was married to the head of the Cultural Resource Agency, and there was literally a direct link in terms of holding on to collections. And every time Caltrans would go in to build a road, you know, the protocol was the Cultural Resource Agency would go in and collect the remains. And then, you know, there was just this, this incredible um, linkage. It's, you know, classic follow the money so to speak, and then uh, the archaeology students at Berkeley that were then doing contract archaeology in Hawaii to make way for hotels. And so just thinking through that, I mean, there's so much work to be done on the base level around NAGPRA compliance. I learned about the holdings at Wesleyan in 2003 and was on, you know, the rampage to try and get a NAGPRA compliance officer in there. And, you know, fortunately had unanimous support in anthropology, American studies, and archaeology, but it took us until 2014 to get someone in there that would do it. So if this kind of work, I think, the shape-shifting, it's more, I want to know what colleagues in anthropology, besides, you know, the theoretical sort of decolonization and being open to different methodologies, 
or you know, kind of rethinking, you know, different particular methods. You know, thinking through the institutional power and the really enduring colonial legacies. So I'll just say that for now. All right, um, at this time, we'd like to open it up for comments from the floor and any other questions as well. So if you are interested in uh, offering a comment or, or giving a question to the panel, please approach the, the microphone, one of the microphones, um, so that uh, your voice and your question can be heard. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Gajendra Nayaturaya. I come from India. Um, this, this question is uh, to Professor um, Kawanui. Um, I, I would like to ask, you said something very interesting about ancestral archives and how this could be used for both the indigenous uh, people's rights and political movements and so on. Especially, I, I would like to know a little more detail because um, I also wor work with uh, indigenous peoples in India, and uh, many of them, like we talk about racism in the US, they are prone to something called casteism, caste, caste-based humiliation and disposition and so on. So um, I'm trying to, uh, I work with them, I theorize about their movement and so on. I learn a lot about um, African-American uh, movement theorization and indigenous peoples movement. I, I think there is a connection. Uh, uh, a big deal of connection which is not explored yet, which has to be done, uh, between indigenous people in India who are fighting against casteism and racism, colonialism and so on, as well as the other groups. So in that sense, um, those communities, many of them are, uh, I'm trying to dig up the old archives. What could be? It could be the folk song, uh, it could be some petition to the British government uh, a couple of centuries ago. and. And, 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 and their own um, elders' uh, uh, oral observations and so on. So in that sense, what do you exactly mean by ancestral archives and what are the potential it has for, for people like us who like to have this cross-fertilization of uh, ideas and exchanges for indigenous peoples like us? Thank you. Hello, is it on? Okay, thank you so much for your question. Um, I want to acknowledge, too, there, there are a lot more uh, Native Hawaiian scholars who have learned Hawaiian language, and of course, learning how to read 19th century Hawaiian language archives. I'm not among them. And I've taken some Hawaiian language, but in terms of actually being able to delve in the archives, I think of also Leilani Basham and other scholars alongside Noe Noe Silva. The thing that I've learned from that work, and, and Kavika, I'm sure you have um, much to say because Kavika is a fluent speaker, um, who's also looked at the archives, but that you know Hawaiians really took to the to the um, the press, and one of the things that's unique about the Hawaiian situation, even though the people who you know formed to overthrow Queen Liliuokalani in 1893 and then subsequently formed their own government called the Republic of Hawaii, they banned Hawaiian language as a medium of instruction, and once the U.S. annexed Hawaii unilaterally through a joint congressional resolution, not a treaty. Those laws stayed on the books until the 1980s. And it's the activists who largely drew from Maori activism, from uh, Kohangareo, that formed Punanaleo in Hawaii, the language nests, that really challenged that law. And at the same time, Hawaii had a, had a double language as Hawaiian as the official language by the late 70s. But in terms of a medium of instruction, those laws were on the books until the 1980s. So that's just context for people who don't, may not know that slice of history. The missionaries, you know, are credited with bringing the word and the word, right? The written scribe and the word of God. Already what falls out of there is that you had dozens, actually, of Kanaka Maoli in Connecticut that inspired or said to inspire the mission to Hawaii. And they were there before the missionaries ever stepped foot in the island. So there's, a, there's an erasure of the, the role of Hawaiian male youth in terms of teaching certain missionaries Hawaiian language before they even got on the boat. Um, and I'm interested in sort of the grammar of that and the, and the written Hawaiian grammar around that, but also the colonial grammar of that erasure. Um, just to get to the bottom line of your question, this, it's hard to talk about Hawaii without some of the, that historical context. There were missionary-controlled uh, newspapers, and then there were Hawaiian nationalist-controlled newspapers. 
and I hope I'm not getting the years wrong, but if you look at Noe Noe Silva's book, Aloha Betrayed, it really talks about the role of Hawaiian print media in terms of Hawaiian nationalist resistance through cultural production and the, you know, the battle of the pens or the dueling out. And one of the things that she tracks is that when American um, Americans and missionary descendants are pushing hardest against Kanaka Maoli, against native Hawaiians, Hawaiians are responding by printing traditional stories, often focused on Hawaiian women's power, but like serial stories that are really lengthy, that are really traditional and sort of, you know, she suggests that there might be an allegory there in terms of that kind of resistance. So why is it that you get the story of Pele, the fire deity and her sister coming up at those critical times that Hawaiian men, some of the Hawaiian men that she's been researching are the ones actually publishing those stories. But there's this quote in her book from one of the newspapers. It literally is, I believe from 1847, the, they say, we have to write our stories down so that our descendants in 2010 will be able to read us. That's ancestral archives to me. I wasn't thinking of saying this, but I have to respond to that. Um, in 1986, I was in Britain because I was about to go to the International Archaeology Congress, uh, which resulted in spinning off WAC, the radical, politically aware archaeologists. But just before the Congress, I spent a week in Wales with a Welsh nationalist uh, woman, a retired journalism, and she told me that Welsh nationalism uh, gained uh, considerable power by demanding that the BBC have a Welsh language TV channel. And the BBC said, everybody in Wales speaks English. What's the point? There was a nationalist leader who went on a hunger strike. And as he was about to die from starvation, the BBC agreed to have a three-month trial TV channel in Welsh. And my uh, friend told me that this was a critical turning point. It turned out that a very large number of families had the Welsh language channel on, even if the parents actually didn't speak Welsh. It was a gesture of nationalism and rebellion to have the language in their home, and it made a very considerable difference to um, building a power base for uh, Welsh nationalism. You know, and this is relatively recent. I have tried and tried to persuade my Pakuni friends, uh, my Anscapi Pakuni friends, to have the commentary on the Browning Indians, the high school, basketball and football games on the local community TV channel, have the commentary entirely in Blackfoot. And nobody seems to get the point. So, but what this actually brings, what I was going to say, I don't think shape shifting is the best term. I think it's code switching, code switching as in bilingual or trilingual. And I think that using that term um, pictures better the strength of yourself as a citizen of your nation. And you can be bilingual, trilingual, but you're not changing who you are. And I think that's this business of adhering to the discipline. One of the things I wanted to bring up was that when Virginia... I'm sorry, um, if you could try to get to the question, because we only have a few minutes left, and if we want a response right, to come, right, then we'll right, actually need the question. Right. Thank you. Yeah. But I wanted to point out that Vir Virginia Dominguez, in her presidential address to AAA, this was in Montreal, what, three, four years ago, she specifically spoke to, and these are the words she used, the blatant racism within anthropology departments. Her c call to combat this, so far as I have seen, has been completely futile. I have not 
been aware of any anthropology departments that have responded to the blatant racism, uh, certainly not in Milwaukee. And I think that this is something that calls for uh, indigenous anthropologists to continue to band together the way you are, banding together, getting strength in numbers in order to be, to, to support one another against, that's what it is, blatant racism. Thank you. Um, if the, those that are standing just want to offer questions rather than comments, and we'll try to get to them in a set of responses. A question on a different topic for indigenous anthropology. My name is Gerald Sider. I have worked in native rights and native issues now for the past 50 years. Over these, everything from federal recognition to land claims to domestic violence, child suicide, substance abuse, etc. The most significant development in both Canadian and North American Native communities over the past 50 years has been the massive increase in internal inequality in these communities. And in my sense of what's happening, much as we may celebrate the success of the Native elites, the vulnerable in these Native communities, the poor women, children are in vastly worse situation now than they were 50 years ago when the community was more unified, even though they were unified over poverty. As a domestic violence has increased, substance abuse has increased, child rape, I mean, I'm talking about very heavy diff consequences of differentiation. As a white anthropologist, much as I have been able to try to do with the oppressions of the Canadian and American state against these communities, I have been completely helpless to touch the inequality within these communities and to be blunt about it, the role of tribal elites in either ignoring or perpetuating the suffering of the poor and the vulnerable. So I wanted to ask the wonderful people here what you see as your possible role, if any, in that context. All right, with apologies to those who are standing, we just are at the end of the time, so we can just take a couple one-minute <laughs> responses. Um, we're just at, we're at 11.45 already. I think, I don't even think, I'm sorry to those who are standing, but we're actually at the end of the time, so I don't want to give you at least this chance to respond to either of the, the two questions that were put out there and offer any closing thoughts at, at the same time. Okay, I'll work with tribal elites. I'm not saying I'll work with them, but as an anthropologist, I have recently been able to critique. Um, in New Zealand at the moment, we have claims to water. Uh, tribal elites have joined together and have decided that it would be very good for Maoridom to own water. Uh, I have been commissioned by another group of tribes who are perhaps not at that same level um, as far as power is concerned to create a group and create an identity for this group that will have a counterclaim to water that is more uh, helpful to the ordinary people. So as an anthropologist, I'm actually representing those, creating new identities for people without power, and that's where I sit socially, and I think that is a contribution that I can make, is play to play around with, not play around with, but with create new spaces for people that don't have power, in New Zealand, some Maori tribes have a lot of power, some don't. It's all to do with whether they've settled their treaty claim or not and what sorts of natural resources they have in their territory. But as an anthropologist, I'm quite happy to be commissioned to do work or work with those tribes that want to be part of the action to uplift people uh, inside their tribes. Sorry, we're getting the, you need to get out of here signal already. Um, but I do hope that the provocations offered here are, what? Oh, the 12. Oh, okay, sorry. Why, why did I think that we were done? I'm so sorry. I'm the worst timekeeper ever. <laughs>
Let's pass this on. I thought we were done. So I kept my comments um, brief uh, on the first round, thinking that for once I would be the person that afterwards people would want to talk to. <laughs> Joking. I, it is a lonely space. <laughs> um, so out, out there uh, are these issues of um, both um, racism um, within the context of anthropology and also uh, the role of, I think, both Native and non-Native anthropologists in um, the exacerbation of violence and um, um, poverty and, and things within our communities. And I, and I think um, a lot of uh, the work that I see, it's very helpful. Um, it, it goes beyond, you know, the mere publication of such, you know, instances that it actually is, you know, on the ground, very active, um, setting up institutions, that uh, the role of anthropologists who are witnessing such things that means that it's not just at the level of a theory anymore, that um, you're building a series of relationships um, uh, with people who um, really need help, and um, I think as an ethical responsibility, just, again, the witnessing requires a set of relationships and responsibilities that, um, as a practice, I think about working within, you know, my own community in terms of having, you know, a PhD and relative forms of privilege in, in all sorts of ways. I think um, just, you know, that doesn't guilt me up, you know, it actually is empowering to say I actually have access to resources and things that can actually help people. So I think um, that's it. And and I, I did mention, I did compare the invention of, you know, strategic essentialisms and devil advocate people, and I said to racism, but that, I, I, didn't, I wasn't calling anthropologists racist necessarily, although when I think of, um, <laughs> it's only because I couldn't uh, compare them to Nazis or slave owners, so uh, the, 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 my ability to have the politics of, uh, you know, I should be running for office, obviously. So the, um, I, I do think that calling out that there is these, uh, you know, it, again, it's, it's about ally building and the, and the ability to call out um, and really work um, in collaboration. I, I think one of the hopeful things in anthropology and the way it's practiced at the University of Maine is um, a lot of us are engaged on environmental issues and I think we're seeking to work collaboratively with each other as well. And I think um, indigenous and non-indigenous anthropologists working together uh, creates a really powerful set of learning experiences that I see um, actually our students um, imitating and, and that's extremely hopeful. It wasn't, if I just think that, that the fact that I'm even in the anthropology department at the University of Maine, I would have said, you know, 20 years ago when I was, um, or maybe even 15 years ago when I was leaving graduate school that, you know, there's no way they would have me. I'm too, you know, weird or whatever. Um, I just don't fit, but the idea that the, now we have this, you know, we can do practice an anthropology there that is not, you know, so vested in vestiges of, of colonial imaginaries, I think is really, really hopeful. I don't think that question can really be properly answered in just a few moments. So I'm just gonna um, restrict my uh, thoughts to just one idea. For me, I suppose um, our role is to critically support our indigenous, our leaders as drivers of change. It's, that's where the change needs to happen is at that level of their leadership as opposed to us fighting necessarily unless they ask us to on their behalf of their communities. Hi, um, I just wanted to quickly thank you, thank you all for your um, talk and also the panel from yesterday, the grad students, indigenous grad students. I wanted to um, basically ask you guys about the marginalization of indigenous studies in anthropology. As somebody, um, I'm Tibetan and I come from a colonized place and um, uh, it was actually indigenous scholarship that I most related to in terms of talking about Tibet and the 
as far as the modernizing projects, the civilizing projects in the form of capitalist economies, especially in China. And um, for me, that's the most important area of studies that is useful for me. And Tibetans also don't identify themselves as indigenous because they don't understand what it means. Um, so I do think the terminology in the international realm is really important as far as solidarity is concerned. Um, and I was, at, I was gonna ask you as far as, um, what, what do you think is the reason for why indigenous studies is so marginalized? For me, it was really hard to find indigenous scholarship, especially in anthropology. Um, so if you could have some words on that. So I will take the second question as well so we can try to answer both. Okay, it's, it's a completely different kind of question. Hi, I'm Frances Morphy. I'm from the Australian National University in Australia. Um, I was really interested in the, fra the question, can we contaminate colonial categories? And categories are something that I work on and think about a lot. And the question that occurred to me is, all of you are having to speak to each other and to us through English. And that's an inevitable kind of consequence of the way the world is today. My question really is the extent to which that is a complicating factor in this discourse and how you deal with it. Well, thank you for the uh, both of the questions. And I think they're not necessarily, they're the questions are not necessarily separate. And, uh, and thank you, Alice, for your conversation and question as well. Uh, and language is an important part of this. And one of the things that we, we've been talking about the last couple of days is uh, we are in this awkward position of having to deal with Western concepts, Western philosophies, uh, and we've been disciplined in various forms and practices. Uh, and, but one of the things that is uniting us is that common experience, and if you want to call it a lingua franca, of indigeneity. So let's just put that out there, you know, as a conceptual uh, tool. Okay, so the lingua franca of indigeneity does not preclude, and this is why uh, Barba shared the translation of shapeshifter. And this is the next step. How do we, from our respective positions, our cultures, our languages, reinterpret these English terms in such a way that we can then ca calibrate across our conversations to reform and reimagine what these categories are, what is possible in terms of indigeneity. And because if we can do that, then we can also bring other English scholars into the conversation. And again, I use the term epistemic slippage, and we're all in this because we're engaging in this epistemic slippage. Can our own bases of knowledge begin to move towards an understanding where we may not understand completely, but we can become closer in sharing those ideas. And I think this is where the larger global discourse of indigeneity can be useful for other communities who recognize that they have similar experiences. So the lingua franca of indigeneity is an invitation for this conversation and once the conversation takes place, then the specificities and the experiences uh, is something that enriches the experience rather than confuses the experience. I mean, that's, that's my take. Anybody else? Um, in my work as an anthropologist, one thing that I've really focused on is, is using some Western theories like Frederick Barth and Michel Foucault and others that have written about discourse and knowledge and tried to think about ways in which Maori concepts, fundamental Maori concepts, things like whānau or family, whanaungatanga relationships, or kaitiakitanga, which Merita has written about a lot, how those Maori concepts can be used and understood uh, in my work. And so I've also, in order to do that, I really go right back to where I'm from in the Waikato, where we have our, our own concepts that we um, privilege. I'm from the Kingitanga, which is a, a different type of Maori group where we have a, a real hierarchy where I'm from. And so some of the things that we do in my tribe 
are a little different to what Merata would do in her tribe. So the way that I've pushed forward as an anthropologist is to really know my own people's fundamental concepts. Then apply Michel Foucault, apply Frederick Barth, and try and, and explain environment, bringing the two together. I mean, if I had a whole lot of graphs, I could show you how it works, but I think I've, translation is really important. We're at the very beginning stages in this group here, but I think the key to a lot of indigenous studies is access to knowledge and being able to really understand how those concepts work on the ground at home with the indigenous communities. So that's my answer. I just have a couple really quick points. I think uh, the question around indigenous studies marginalized within anthropology, one of the things that comes to mind is Lee Baker's book, Anthropology and the Racial Politics of Culture, that really grapples with the roots of American anthropology and also the split of how it is sociology as a discipline comes to, to work on black Americans and how it is that anthropology gets the Indians. And so I think that's one of the, the genealogies I think I would take a look at. I know I'm a co-founder of the Native American and Indigenous Studies Association, so I'd say come on over to NISA. Our next meeting is in May in Honolulu. The other thing is that um, this question around in identifying as indigenous and not understanding what it is, I wanted to give kind of the flip side of that because in the book that I'm um, finishing now on kingdom nationalists, I'm looking at indigenous Hawaiian nationalists who are focused on restoring the Hawaiian kingdom and they know exactly what indigenous is, but they have disidentified, they disavow, them, they disavow the indigeneity of their own selves precisely because they know that it is a category of political subordination, not just under US federal law, but under international law. And so that's just one of those kinds of things. I mean, how do we deal with the, co the cultural contradictions around that? And so that's really gets a little bit complicated. And the last point I wanted to make around indigeneity and why it bugs people out, um, you know, we, people know that it's socially constructed. People talk about race, gender, sexuality, and other categories of difference as social constructs. But for some reason, the burden on indigenous scholars to try and justify indigeneity as a category of analysis or one's indigenous subjecthood is just really over the top. And I think that's about settler anxieties. And I also think that that's something we really have to tackle. I think it's really still obscene, actually. And people will be like, but it's so complicated. And it's like, it might be complicated when you're trying to compare all these different nations, but within our own context, it's actually not that complicated. Hawaiian version, for example, is bilateral. You, you get your Hawaiian-ness any way you can. That doesn't mean that we don't have elitism. It doesn't mean we don't have class politics. It doesn't mean we don't have colorism. It doesn't mean we don't have internalized racism. But the indigenous piece is not complicated, actually. It's genealogical. It's very simple. It might be very different in Penobscot. It might be very different at Maliseet. Maori Dunn does it differently. So I just wanted to put that out there. Um, so just responding to the first um, question, I think partly why it's difficult to locate those sources is they leave anthropology early, or at least that's what I've seen. Um, with Pacific scholars trained in anthropology, they go to ethnic studies, they go to gender studies, they go to Pacific studies, they go to indigenous studies, and the ones that stay in anthropology have to kind of survive the battle, right? Um, the pre-tenure and then into kind of their life as associate and full professors. Um, and so just thinking in terms of the work that I've done has been not necessarily to translate, but to think about intersections where you have um, different sort of indigenous Samoan concepts um, shaping agendas, action, right, values, and the way it intersects with things like um, American capitalism, uh, US empire, um, global sporting industries, right? How do we see those coming together or you know, what are the places where they diverge? And so that's one of the things that I've been thinking through. But in terms of the, the kind of Psalm 1 research, I haven't necessarily looked to anthropology. In fact, I've looked to our philosophers, our theorists, our oral historians, mm -hmm. Um, to really bring that material together. And then, of course, I, ha I also have to talk about the anthropology of Samoa as well, which, you know, I have done. Um, but it, it wasn't my sort of primary, it wasn't the first place I went. Okay, now we are at the end of time. 
Um, I also wanted to acknowledge Aaron Glass, who was um, a, a key uh, collaborator and interlocutor in, in helping to organize this and trying to give me the right time, even though I kept on misreading. Um, but really, I want to extend a great appreciation to all of our panelists who have joined us today, to those in the audience who have offered your questions. We hope to continue this dialogue beyond this. Um, and so thank you for coming and joining us. Mahalo. <laughs>